German and Russian businesses over the transport of natural gas between their countries. Proponents of sanctions say, sanction this, sanction that. The Department of Treasury is currently administering dozens of sanctions programs designed to change the behavior of certain countries. And yet, no one seems to ask the important questions. Do sanctions promote peace and understanding, or do they escalate tension between nations? What behavior has China modified since the U.S. began sanctions? Has Russia changed her behavior? Has Russia given back Crimea? Mr. President, can we have order on the floor, please? Would you, uh, senators, please take their conversations outside of the chamber. The senator from Kentucky. Sanctions, though lacking in proof of effectiveness, are very popular with both parties. Embargoes, sanctions, Big Brother also garner bipartisan enthusiasm. The U.S. embargo of Cuba has now gone on for more than 60 years without any evidence of a change in regime or even a change in regime's policy. Embargoes are often described, especially by the embargoed country, as an act of war. Many historians say that the U.S.'s embargo of 1807 ultimately led to the War of 1812. President Jefferson's embargo was intended to punish France and England for their aggressions, but instead the embargo crippled American shipping exports. Exports declined by 75 percent. Some historians also blame the U.S. embargo of Japan for the ensuing war. Roosevelt seized many of Japan's assets, and Japan lost access to much of its international trade and over 80 percent of its imported oil. Effectively, at least from the perspective of Japan, the embargo was an act of war. Yet enthusiasts for embargoes and sanctions still clamor for more. Sanctionistas point to the international sanctions against Iran as the lever that brought about the Obama-era nu era nuclear agreement with Iran. Perhaps, but an equally valid argument can be made that it was the extension of carrots rather than sticks that brought Iran to the table. Funny how diplomacy seems to require give and take, not just take, take, take. Our interaction with Iran should illuminate today's debate over sanctions on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline between Russia and Germany. But the shade of mercantilism is dimming the light of experience. Opponents of the pipeline, not surprisingly, are largely from states that compete in the sale of natural gas. This is more about protectionism than it is national security. Reports are that the pipeline will cause a significant reduction in U.S. exports of liquid natural gas, hence the keen interest by people representing states that sell natural gas. This is not so much about national security, it's about protectionism. Acknowledging that this debate is only superficially about national security and really more about provincial protectionism helps us better understand the dynamics. History demonstrates that trade and interconnectedness between nations is a barrier to war. Engaging in mutually beneficial commerce coupled with a potent military deterrence is the combination that best promises peace. Over the past decade, Congress and presidents have heaped sanctions on Russia and China. When I've asked the State Department officials who come before our committee to reveal what behavioral changes have come about as a result of sanctions, I've often got blank stares. Now the sanctionistas want to sanction an already completed pipeline. Last year they said if we put sanctions on, we'll stop them. Well, the Senate and the House overwhelmingly passed sanctions. We got sanctions and they still completed the pipeline. But what behavior are they now asking Russia to change? What specifically is Russia been asked to do? What Russian action is necessary for these sanctions to end? I've asked the sponsor of this bill, the sanctions that you want to do to Russia, what behavior, what do you want from Russia? The response is they don't want any behavioral chances from Russia. The word-for-word -word response from the sponsors of this bill is they just want Russia not to ship oil to Germany. It's about trade. It's about trade that might compete with certain natural gas producing states. It has nothing to do with national security. If Nord Stream 2 sanctions were really about changing Russian behavior or deterring aggression in Ukraine, then NATO 
including Germany, could threaten sanctions if Russia invades Ukraine. Now that, the threat of sanctions with Germany as an ally might actually have deterring value. In fact, last summer, the U.S. and Germany did just that. The U.S. and Germany announced an agreement in which they said jointly that any attempt to use energy as a weapon or commit further aggressive acts against Ukraine will be met with sanctions. This is Germany and the U.S. together. That has power. Our little pinprick sanctions saying we, we don't like you and we're going to punish the companies that are involved will do nothing. If we actually worked with Germany, we have deterring value. Germany could turn off the spigot to the natural gas like that. If it's a valid threat from Germany with us together, we might be able to deter Russia. But simply turning the gas pipeline off now and sanctioning it is like being a hostage taker and saying, we don't want you to do this and we have your hostage, and then going ahead and shooting the hostage before you get what you want. We should threaten sanctions. The threat of sanctions has, power, has power. Once you turn them on and you have no plan to turn them off, you have no leverage over Russia and you do nothing. The commitment or the agreement between Russia, I mean between Germany and the U.S. from the agreement says the commitment is desi designed to ensure Russia will not misuse any pipeline, including Nord Stream 2, to achieve aggressive political ends or they will be met with sanctions. This could be a deterrence. The more countries that got together and said this, international community of sanctions can have some effect. One country's sanctions, particularly against its ally, Germany, will have no effect. The rush to impose sanctions now undermines the threat of sanctions to deter Russian aggression against Ukraine. You put the sanctions on now and you offer them nothing and no way to remove the sanctions, how are you deterring anything? In fact, you might well make them angry enough that they actually do act in response to the sanctions in the opposite of what you've intended. As today's debate unfolds, I think you'll find that sanctions against Nord Stream 2 are more about mercantilism and protectionism than national security. Thank you.